Welcome back, I'm Chris Moore with HVAC Pro Blog, and this week I'm excited to present a recording from one year ago for my Patreon members on ACA Manual T, specifically return air outlets. We're gonna discuss performance, where you should put them, how to size them, and verifying pressure drops across spaces. Without further ado, here's the class. All right, so the first thing I wanna cover with return inlets is performance. Like I said before, if you're gonna put supply air into a room, you really should take the same volume of air back out of the room. And you need to get that air back to the coil and air conditioning in order to remove the moisture. Poor return air paths is probably the number one reason why you don't remove moisture in a home. Of course, assuming that you sized and selected the system correctly. Uh, that would be the third portion of system design, which is manual deep duct design and getting those rooms cool. But the design of the duct work is really based around changing the sensible temperature. The return air inlets are what pull the air back in order to blow that air across the coil and remove the moisture. All of latent capacity in the house is removed at the coil. As long as you're not short circuiting the supply and the return air, the location of the return air inlet is pretty much negligible in the space. This is because the pulling power, or how far out away from the return it actually pulls air in, is just one to two feet. So it doesn't really matter. As long as you're not short circuiting those supply and return locations where the air is going out the supply and directly back into the return, then it really is negligible. Ideally, we wanna use a return air path though to cut down on stagnant spots in the room that's why we would wanna locate the return probably further away from the supply. Which brings me to location. If you're doing a heating only system, because the stagnant air tends to be lower at floor level, ideally we'd wanna put the return air lower, closer to floor level. Of course, it's the opposite with cooling, right? The stagnant air in a room that's being cooled or air conditioned is typically up high. So we'd wanna have those high or ceiling returns if it's a cooling only system. So what do we do when we're doing heating and cooling? Now, my personal recommendation is just do the opposite of where your supply ducts are. So if your supply ducts are in the ceiling, put your returns in the floor or down low. If your supplies are down low, try to get your returns up high. This will knock down the majority of the season's stagnant spots in the room on both sides. Unfortunately, when you talk about, as an example, a colonial, a lot of people will put a system up in an attic that heats and cools. And if they don't bring the returns down low through some sidewalls, you end up with some stagnant spots in those rooms, right? It's really easy for some people to just throw a supply duct into the center of a room with a four-way grill and then maybe try to pull the return air by depressurizing spaces. This is when we start to really run into problems because not a lot of people really know how to depressurize spaces or pull air back without big pressure differences. Also, when you're putting those return grills in walls, most people put the louvers down so you don't see into the ductwork. And this is actually incorrect. If you want the least amount of restriction and the most amount of volume of air to come back in the return, you want those louvers facing up it's counterintuitive, and of course, if they're down low, you're gonna see down into the duct. That's not upside down, that's correct. That's gonna actually provide less restriction and more volume of air back into that return duct. If you actually have the, the louvers facing down, there's more restriction going into that fitting, and you're gonna end up getting less volume of air back. All right, let's talk about sizing return air paths. So I would say the number one thing is just sizing a grill, right? You always size a grill for 300 feet per minute. Notice it's a little lower, or sometimes significantly lower than a supply duct. This typically means the return duct tends to be larger so they're not noisy in order to pull back air without much restriction, okay? Also, when sizing these, the pressure drop is typically 0.03 inches of water column. So you need to have that feet per minute and that pressure drop. And it's really simple when you go into a catalog of, of return grills to see what's gonna be able to carry that volume of air based on those two metrics. Or 
Remember, that 300 feet per minute is gross area. You could just get that right off your duck calculator. If you didn't know, I did a blog on this quite a few months ago on return grills. Take a look. I actually put this on a chart for you because most return grills or most filter grills actually fall into the same gross area. And I didn't realize it was such a trend. So I compiled it all, put it in a chart. So that way, you, if you fly back a few months, you can get that uh, blog post and use that resource going forward. Return transfer grills are a slightly different animal. We need these to be even less restrictive because a lot of times they're located in doors or walls. Typically, a transfer grill is sized for 200 feet per minute, even as low as 150 feet per minute to make sure that there's no noise and they're large enough and don't provide a lot of restriction because we don't want to depressurize that room. And then of course, everyone's favorite, undercutting a door. The unfortunate thing with undercutting a door is doesn't mean someone's not going to come in and put carpet over that, let's say, hardwood floor. And now the area you had is less and now you depressurize that space or you can't get the air back out of that room when the door's closed, right? When you're undercutting a door, the rule is every inch you undercut is about 60 CFM. But remember, you can't just undercut three inches for 180 CFM because three inches undercutting a door could cause some privacy issues. Then of course, there's filter grills. Filter grills probably should be sized for a slightly less feet per minute than you would with a normal grill. So in manual T, they actually recommend 200 feet per minute. And that's because filters will start to get dirty and an ECM motor will ramp up and now the air is moving across that filter grill faster and it turns into a slight harmonica sometimes. Now the last thing I wanna talk about is actually not a manual T, it's just personal experience. What I found, the easiest way to calculate how much area I need to add in order to cut down the pressure differences across rooms is to do a simple pressure check across those doors. So what I like to do is take a dual input manometer, run a long, let's say quarter inch hose, most of them are quarter inch, you run them under the door, and then you have it open to the space you're in. And make sure that your manometer reads Pascals, it's the metric version of inches of water column. With the system operating at 100% capacity, if you have more than a five Pascal difference across those rooms, then you have an imbalance in that space because you are not taking back enough air or maybe too much air, or there's no return in that space and you're trying to depressurize and there's not enough free area in that transfer grill or undercut door. In order to figure out how much area you need to add, you just slowly open the door until the pressure gets close to zero, less than five Pascals. And then you calculate the width in inches times the height right and you'll know the free area that you need to add in a transfer grill it's a pretty quick easy calculation and a nice way to know if those returns are undersized or you're going to depressurize spaces like your hallway because you can't get the air back so what'd you think about the training on return air inlets if you liked it why don't you let me know in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe if you want this content one year early head over to my Patreon page where you can sign up for as little as $8 a month and get access to two years worth of blogs and the last year's worth of recorded trainings. Thanks for joining me this week at HVAC Pro Blog, where we provide advice for residential system design, quality installation, and system diagnosis. I'll see you soon.